Can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear, Gail. Can you hear me? Yes, how you sick? <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Gail Porter. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> 50 big ones, Gail. I know exactly. Oh my God, it's literally, <laughs> my postman was like, I'm not coming back. I was like, you've been, you've been coming back with flowers from 7 a.m. I was like, it's like, it's a really big birthday or something. I went, I honestly think people have written me off. I think they're like, no, it's her last birthday. Like, she's so Do you dead. know what? In this day and age, to get any cards, I always think is a win. Every Christmas, and but uh, birthdays, I get two. One from my dad, one from my mum. That's it. Every Christmas, I'm lucky if I get two or three from outside of the family. So, I mean, that, Gail, is a shower of love, is what that is so many star wars toys oh my <laughs> i've got balloons and everything is this okay i to put my um, blinds down a bit yeah put the blinds down so we can see you in more is that yeah. still a bit weird shall i do yeah. mm, you've got kermit behind you i'm happy about that <laughs> I have a house of a child <laughs> have you have you got disney plus i presume you have i, mean, I presume yeah. you're Oh, you got to get it. They've got all the Muppet stuff on there. My telly. I don't have the right kind of telly. Well, that's Apparently, what you should have asked for for your for your fiftieth birthday, girl. Yeah, shall I move this right there? Because I feel like I'm all shiny and stuff. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Show you my virtual. Well, it's not my virtual house. It's a real house. So uh... <laughs> my actual real life house. Uh, oh no! Have I, have I got rid of myself again? You have, but you'll be back. It's all right. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. The sequel. Yeah. Is that better? Like... Yeah. I mean, the video doesn't go anywhere anyway. It's all right, but it's like makes it easier for like. I, I might I might put a little clip of me singing happy birthday to you online, but other than yeah, that. Yeah, do that. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fun. Other than do that, as long as the audio is nice and clear, that's all that matters to me. What's this? A cane? No, it's an electric shock machine. Yep. So you just you can put it on someone and then they get a ticket to the co-op just in case anyone comes near me. <laughs> well, if I feel like that is a very um <laughs> what's the word? Tragic? No, no. I, I was <laughs> I was gonna make a segue from there, but it's um it's not it's not proper. Um but we will get there eventually. Um I want to ask you this, Gail, first of all. Sorry. No, if somebody had said to you, if I had said to you yeah. Three three years ago when we first met that you'd be spending your 50th birthday on this thing called Zoom yeah, chatting to me in a world pandemic, what would you have said? Bring it on. No, I would, <laughs> <laughs> I would have just gone, do you know what? Would, yeah, no. I mean, the pandemic thing is just insane. Um, the Zoom thing is just mad. I spend all my life on Zoom now. It's pretty much my life is on Zoom. That's why I'm wearing these. They're not real glasses. They're blue blockers. So they block out the blue light from laptop screens. So because I yes. find if if I'm on them all day, when I was writing my book, I just found I'd go to bed at night and I'd get really bad headaches from just the overexposed blue light of a computer screen all day. So these just block out the blue light. I haven't got a copy of your book yet. Well, what you did do, though, Gail, is you called me on the day that I announced that I yes. was going to be doing one. And I wanted to thank you for that publicly because it's interesting and I'm sure you can, you know, maybe shed some light on this. I find when you do something like you must've found this with the documentary that you worked on when you make something that, you know, your heart and soul has gone into and you've worked really hard on it and you're extremely proud of it. You really find out who your friends are. Um, yeah. in the sense, what I did, I found that so many people that, you know, from my past that I would have presumed would have been on the phone, like you were, weren't. And then, you know, certain people in my life like you, who I haven't known that long, extended that hand of, of friendship and, you know, showed your happiness for me at a time that really meant a lot to me. I was and, so excited for you. Well, it was just, it was a very sweet gesture. And I want you to know that I'm very grateful. Are you frozen? Oh, that'll be another Hang card. <laughs> Hang on, wait, sorry. <laughs> it's all good. There might be a few of these as the conversation unfolds. Amazing. 
you can never have too many flowers and it's so spring like outside at the moment as well oh my god that's i don't even know what to do with them all I'm, i suppose i'll have to give them to somebody i guess what the flowers Mm -hmm. I've, yeah. only got one I've got eight bouquets of flowers do you see bouquets? <laughs> you have to put them in pint glasses <laughs> it's like put little ones all over the all over the flat but yeah so the book um it's doing well isn't it yeah we've done just shy of a thousand which i'm extremely surprised by uh and, and very pleased with i thought by summertime maybe we'd get up to a thousand but the last i checked in we're like nearly there already um and and considering all the delays, uh, there was a lot of delays because of COVID and Brexit, considering those and just the fact that I'm, you know, a first time author, fairly unknown in the literary world. Obviously, my podcast is, you know, of a decent size, but it's not huge. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm really pleased with with the numbers so far. And more than that, I've just been really touched by the feedback that people who've read the book have given me. Um, yeah, it's a very validating feeling because... I've written loads throughout my life and I've shared a lot of my thoughts on the podcast and, you know, social media, but to put it all down into a book, as you well know, Gail, is that's a whole other level, isn't it? Of, of the exploration of the did soul. You, did you ever get to the stage? Cause I set fire to mine, right? Um, this is not even a joke. I got so angry with myself and I was writing. I was like, oh, I don't really like it. So it was like, I was handwriting everything. And then <laughs> Like got a lighter chucked out the window so i didn't even like that and then suddenly when i threw it out i thought oh actually that was quite good oh damn it <laughs> set fire to my book <laughs> is that why there's been so many delays yeah you've been burning your work that. as you go and that and also um publisher um first publisher he went bankrupt so so uh, they got dumped, dumped me and then the second one just dumped me because they didn't want to do it and now i've got two or three that are playing with it so i don't even know I don't even care anymore <laughs> Well, you will. I mean, I, I can appreciate the frustration with the business side of it. You know, I've had that with the COVID delays that have meant that people who've ordered my book months ago, you know, had to wait. And so th there's definitely like hurdles and, yeah. and things in place that frustrate you and suck the creativity and the joy out of it. But you've got to persevere. Um, so have you finished it? Is it all done? Yeah, it's pretty. I mean, it's, it's been done ages ago. I mean, I finished it. I about a year a year and a half ago but then obviously with this that's happened and my dad passed away um uh, just before lockdown the first ever lockdown in spain so i had to go and pick him up well yeah but obviously get his ashes <laughs> anyway yeah. so then that was a whole new different ending to the book because i was like oh right so this is a new story so i've just sort of like i keep twerking it all the time and just kind of playing with it until you know i've well, I can't tell you. I'll tell you privately. But, yeah. Okay. Well, one um, thing, one thing I'd like to say, and I say this with all all the love and respect in the world to you, is what I learned with mine and what I've learned with speaking to songwriters over the years is things like these are never finished. A book yeah. or a song or a film that they're never ever truly finished, and I think that's why some people spend years and years and years. I think what you have to do is just get to that point where you go, "This is as, as complete as it's going to be. It's time to." share with the rest of the world now because otherwise you'll just keep revising and, and updating and editing and changing and yeah i think once somebody takes it off my hands then i'll go right it's done now but because it's kind of still floating about because of covid and we're not sure what's happening so i've done a screenplay so that's gone so that's i'm not touching that and then um the book is just <laughs> i keep going oh, i'm going to do that again oh actually i don't like that person anymore oh yeah oh god yeah yeah <laughs> that person's died now so we'll just yeah no it's not that morbid but you know what i mean <laughs> you just keep twerking it like you say it's like you want to keep tweaking not twerking that's like dirty. <laughs> like the that... dirty dance that people do yeah <laughs> the dirty so... dance have you written the screenplay yourself you've done that too i yeah well what i did was i sort of like cut everything down from the book and then sent it off to a film company that i'm working with and they've also got um screenwriters so they actually know what they're doing as opposed to me just keep writing Making so i've actually up. got grown-ups that are looking after me says the 50 year old woman with balloons in her house <laughs> <laughs> and, and don't forget kermit the frog and kermit and everything yeah <laughs> well cheers but, like, to you gail Thank you. It's a pleasure you to be spending. Have you seen my Chewbacca mask? No, but I'd love to. Wait, hang on. I'll just go. Sorry for everybody on the audio podcast not not enjoying the full visual display. Keep talking. No, but the thing is, you can hear it, so it's all good. <laughs> oh, sorry. Chewbacca mask. 
I know exactly what's coming out. Here we go. <laughs> there was Can a viral there was a viral video, wasn't there, of a woman in a car who laughing. just was the happiest human being alive. Was that what inspired you to buy it? You're like, I need a piece of that. that I happiness stopped. right there. Actually, I went to the Disney store and the Disney store, this this is how tragic my life is. I go in and they go, All right, Gail. And I was like, honey, my daughter goes, by name. Oh my God. <laughs> they know you by your first name. And I was like, Do you know where that Chewbacca mask is? They went, Yeah, Debenhams. I was like, right. So it's a Debenhams. They only had one, so I bought it. Wore it at home on the tube. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. First name basis. And they're like, Yeah, Debenhams, come on, get out. We haven't got any. Does it bring you joy every time you wear it or can you overdo something like that? Can you have too much no, of a good thing? No, it brings me joy every single day. It just makes me laugh. I don't know why. It's stupid, but it just makes me happy. I've got an interactive um, R2-D2 and Obi-Wan Kenobi. I've got to tell you something. I'm single, age 50. <laughs> I know, right? Well, I've got to tell you something. I don't like Star Wars. I'm one of the few people that doesn't. And I always break the hearts of... of star wars lovers when i tell them that but i've just you like star trek no i mean i love science fiction i think what it was and what it is is because i didn't grow up on them i don't have that you, how old are you matt 35 yeah but they like were they, they were still around in the 80s i know they came out sort of late 70s into the early 80s but they, they were still a part of my generation but i think when you grow when you're growing up you either have older siblings or parents that kind of pass their whether they do it consciously or not their film tastes onto you and my my parents just my dad hated sci-fi wasn't into it at all so i'd watch westerns with my dad like old john wayne movies and then i'd watch musicals like mary poppins and sound of music with my mum so it was musicals and westerns in my house never any sci-fi so i never saw star wars as a kid so i don't have that youthful attachment to it so now when i watch it as an adult i just go eh. see i went to see it in 19 when it came out 1970 77 was the first one yeah, so I went actually queued up at the ABC cinema in Edinburgh with my mum. There was me, my mum and my brother. And we queued up, went in and I wouldn't leave at all the cinema afterwards. I was crying my eyes out and my mum was like, I don't know what's wrong with you. And I was like, I want to live in space. I love, I love Luke Skywalker. I want to be Princess Leia. And she was like, oh my God. So she bought me two massive badges. So I had one on my left breast and one on the right. So I had Luke on my left and I had Princess Leia on the right. And then I went to school the next day with my hair, like in the, the buns. Bun. Yeah. And then I wondered why I got picked on at school. Who knew? <laughs> you wonder why you and Bremner wasn't, you know, yeah. <laughs> accepting your advances. Gail told me on the phone yesterday that you went to school with you and Bremner. Um, well, he was which, here with me. But the same school, right? Yeah, Portobello High School. Yeah. Which in itself is incredible. And then you told me that you had a big crush on him I had a as well. Yeah, but he didn't know, and I didn't tell him because I was quite shy. And um, I just used to watch him. I think, oh, I love him. He's, <laughs> not, love he's him. not. He's not what you'd call a stereotypical kind of heartthrob either. What was it about him that drew you in? Quirky. Yeah. He was quirky. Yeah, he was always like that, was he? He yeah. I remember he had like he had um, rainbow trousers once. He turned up at school with rainbow trousers on, and I loved him for that. And he didn't seem to bother what anyone thought. Not that I, you know, I was not cool enough to be hanging out with anybody really. But um, I just remember he had rainbow trousers once and I just thought, oh my God, I loved his hair. I loved everything about him. And then look at him now. Well, th I think there is something very appealing and attractive about somebody that has little regard for others' opinions in the sense that, you know, they're not held back by the judgment of others, right? They're yeah. free. They're truly free. And they're above or seemingly above those concerns that plague us all as kids, which is what are they going to think of me? I need to fit in. Um, Never seen, he, just, he just sort of like floated into school. And I just remember just being completely thinking, oh, he's super cool. And now he's done amazing. But yeah. I knew he was amazing. And obviously the, the new McGee movie just came yeah. out the other day, which we were talking about, written by your friend Irvin Welsh with you and as Alan in it. And um, I mean, we've spoken about the 90s before when, when you were on my show last, but when you watch that film and, and when you indeed, you know, any films that are either set in that time frame or, you know, referencing that time, do you find yourself thinking back to the good times, to the bad times? Does it kind of not really touch you in a nostalgic way either way? Always good, always good Always times. good. Anything that I... Um... 
anything to do with the 90s just makes me smile it really does because we just had fun nobody seemed to you know it was not kind of there was, you know no one was worried about being politically incorrect we were just having a laugh uh, whereas now you can't say things you can't do things whereas then we didn't even know what day it was to be honest with you <laughs> one massive party when my daughter was saying right mum I'm thinking about going to Manchester uni and I went oh god when are we going up she went there is no we there is no we you are not coming to Manchester I went, oh I used to party and she went I know mum I don't want to know I just don't want to know I used to go to the Hacienda we were talking about that as well oh my god I think yeah. I think it was the last free decade wasn't it it was know? yeah it's like proper fun that was it yeah and, and to what mind when you woke up in the morning and going, there's somebody, who are you? Sorry, in my flat? <laughs> They're going, oh, sorry, you invited everyone back. Oh, did I? Right, okay. <laughs> that well, was the sort of fun we had. There was a lot of everybody on telly and, and in bands and the kind of the pop culture icons of that time all seemed to be from fairly working class backgrounds. And I think it was the last time, obviously in the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s, you had that. And then somewhere along the line, things changed and there's less, I think, working class voices in the entertainment industry and in the arts and in all of these areas now. Um, and as well as that, obviously, there is, as you say, this kind of very eggshelly type, safe, politically correct world which we're in where you can't really say or do too much. Otherwise, you risk offending everybody and being cancelled. And yeah it's it's funny like the film just made me and i was a little bit well, i am a little bit younger than you but i very much grew up in the 90s that was my time and watching creation stories i just you know was <laughs> reminded of what a, a free and exciting and vibrant and quite anarchic period it was yes i mean you know doing things like top of the pops and the big breakfast so you'd be doing top of the pops um getting home about midnight getting up at 2.30 in the morning to go and do the big breakfast live at 7 a.m. And then you'd finish at 9 a.m. And then everyone's like, do we go for lunch or what do we do now? Because our body clocks were all over the place. But we used to go out sometimes, uh, go to Top of the Pops and maybe not actually make it home and go straight to the big breakfast. Like, <laughs> but no one cared. Everyone's like, well, do you know what? You look like you're having fun. So not all the time. I was pretty good all the time. But, you know, maybe once or twice we did the whole we're going to be up all night thing. Well, it's before, imagine, before imagine, cell phones, wasn't it? That's what it was, yeah. I think. Do you know what? I, I was saying this to my daughter. I was like, I was so lucky because we would have got into... Could you imagine the amount of things we got up to in the 90s? Not bad things, but, you know, you don't want to be pictured hanging out the Met bar or, you know, one of those places. Uh, just getting now, wasted and having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Now you can't even go to the court without someone going, oh, just take a quick picture. You go, why? Put your phone away. It's like going to gigs. Put your phones away. Take a picture at the beginning, but don't stand there. Like, I hate that more than anything. Yeah, me just too. Just like people filming the whole gig. You just like, just put your phone away. Enjoy the moment, people. I wonder after a year of being <laughs> starved of it all, whether that will change anything. We'll see. When gigs do return, yeah. we'll see. I hope that people go, you know what? Now I'm going to just enjoy the moment. Now I've seen what life's like without this. I'm not going to waste time just filming it up there. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff I want to ask you, Gail. I don't want to bum you out too much on your birthday, but I do like <laughs> when, I, when I talk to you because we can talk about all kinds of things and, you know, just lay all the cards on the table. Um, with what's happened recently with Sarah Everard and, you know, the, the, the great positive wave of voices rising up and, you know, a, as a man, it's been a really interesting and informative time for me to just sit back and listen and, and hear, um, you know, the other perspective, the female perspective. And, you know, I think it's it's well, 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 well overdue. Um, it seems like as with last summer when the George Floyd incident happened, it seems like a parallel to me. And this was the final straw. Um, and so I'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind, about a your thoughts as a woman um, in the entertainment industry and your experiences. Um, and then also after that, your experiences as a mother of, of a young lady and you know perhaps the worries and concerns you have there but let's start with you if that's okay um were you the victim of much in the way of horrible misogyny in your career oh you're frozen gail you're back i'm back i had to like switch i don't know what happened there was that me or you yeah, Probably I think it, I think it was your internet connection. It was funny though. I just texted you and I just said, "Gail, you completely froze and then disappeared after I brought up misogyny." 
yeah that was it that's what happened um, yeah so what were you asking did you, you were asking? did you hear my question or did you lose oh, the... you completely froze amazing so i was just i was likening what and about me having a daughter and that's as, as much as i got amazing yeah so i just wanted to hear about your experiences as a woman working in the entertainment industry and, and whether or not you were exposed to a darker side of sexism and misogyny you know in the media and entertainment industry in you know your professional career well um most people i worked with were fantastic and lovely and we all just had great fun but i mean i think the biggest thing that happened to me was 1999 when they projected my naked body onto the house of the parliament obviously i knew i did the picture but i wasn't paid they said they weren't going to use it and then i wake up in the morning and i'm naked in front of the entire country and nobody told me at all and that was one time i felt really upset just thinking oh my god i mean yeah I mean, how would they tell you anyway just going oh by the way we're going to do that i said no but i mean now i can look back on it and think well you know people still talk about it but as a female living on my own suddenly seeing that and then when I went to the shops all these guys are like whoa, whoa. and I was like oh god oh my god this is actually a big thing and I felt really um I felt really vulnerable and I thought well you know I obviously I know what I'm doing when I do photo shoots but if they say they're not going to use it and they're not going to pay you you don't expect it to be a hundred foot tall on um a political building i mean so yeah that that, that is the ultimate form of betrayal and you know just like if you weren't such a grounded human being which you well, are that, that um, could have broken me that could have broken me yeah and would have broken so many people because that is like that's as outrageous as it gets isn't it a breach talk about breach of trust and misuse of power well, I, in the line i tried to get in contact with the editor of fhm at the time and not a single person would answer my calls they just it was like i didn't exist anymore and i was because i just wanted why why did you do this and you know it was just so outrageous you just think <laughs> that's that's quite massive uh yeah never never spoke to me never an apology never a phone call nothing I didn't even get a copy of the magazine. <laughs> Not that I wanted it, but you know, it's just like, oh my God, I didn't get paid. They put me naked, a uh, hundred foot tall, and they've all just completely blanked me like I didn't exist. If that happened today, uh, people would be losing would be their jobs, happy. wouldn't they? Just, they'd be straight out. Definitely, 100%. Um, but, so, um, so nobody had your back? No. I didn't have an agent at the time, so I just turned up, did a photo shoot. They said, you know what? It's just going to be a little thing. Um, my mum actually came with me and she was like, oh, look at you. And um, then she phoned me up to say, you're on the news. And that's how I found out. Just literally, I was in the bathroom, went through and it was on BBC News. I heard my name and I was thinking, right, I'm not going to be on the news. Why? Why? And then I saw the image. I mean, it took me a while. I kept looking at it thinking, this has got to be a joke. Then the phone just didn't stop. Didn't stop. And there was people outside the flat there was like there was actually I had a stalker after that and he was sending letters to um to like an, an agent person that I wasn't dealing with and they were forwarding it and then one day after the, the picture happened I got home and there was a handwritten note on my front door with a red rose he got, he'd found out my house address and uh, yeah so that was a bit scary yeah that's creepy creepy shit um yeah, really. so it, it did have a negative effect on your life then obviously as something of that extremity would in the sense that you know you didn't choose to do that but obviously people were seeing it and you know then they make a certain assumption about you as a human being don't they because something like that is so public such a a grand statement that you obviously weren't making yourself it was taken out of your hands yeah that was the thing that upset me. i think that was the thing that upset me the most was the fact that people thought that i had masterminded this whole thing and i wanted to say to everybody I didn't get paid. I didn't know this was happening. Obviously, yeah, I knew the picture was taken, but I didn't think it would, no, never in a million years you're going to think, you know, that that kind of thing's going to happen. So everyone's like, oh, well, you know, you did it yourself. You you obviously made loads of money out of it. I was like, no, I didn't do it. <laughs> Someone took a picture and then decided, I actually saw the guys that um, were involved. They're, they're called cunning, 
cunning stunts. I have to do that really carefully. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and they they apologised. They were like, we were actually behind the whole thing. It was a big PR stunt by FHM, and they hired us to do it. And um, yeah. And they said, are you, are you angry? And I said, well, not now. <laughs> now that, you know, my bottom looked quite nice, but it was a bit, I mean, it was, I spent a good year in shock and knowing that people were judging me, thinking that I was some sort of airhead that gets paid to do these sort of things. So yeah, it was a bit weird, but you know, is what it is, I guess. Yeah, fame is a, a crazy thing, isn't it? And it can really warp people's engagement with the world around them um, because you don't change. But what actually changes with fame is everybody else's opinion and perception of you. And they think yeah. they somehow, because you're on this public platform, have access to you in some way that they know you and that they're allowed to say things about you, even though they don't actually know you. Um, and I've, I've noticed that in a lot of people that have been like at the top of that mountain when the fame hurricane hits is you actually don't really change that much in yourself. It's everything around you and you're trying to frantically adapt to that while staying as sane as you can and you feel also like you um i always felt like i was justifying myself by going i'm not actually i'm not a bad person i'm not and i think why am i justifying myself to people so now i, I feel for kids like my daughter's got a really good head on her shoulder she's 18 years old and i always say to her social media block report end of it's that simple um i don't understand when people get involved in these twitter like arguments and you know, I just think, do you know what, if someone says something mean about you, do you know what my favourite one was? Did I tell you this one? When someone was trying to be mean to me on Twitter, usually nine times out of ten, people are lovely. But this guy said, I wonder if Gail Porter's got any public hair. And I was like, oh, my God, it's pubic. And no, I don't. And if you're going to abuse me, spell it correctly. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing wor uh, There's nothing better, sorry, than when people try and be mean to you online. And they, they're always people who can't spell. They spell their, like, T-H-E-R-E when it should be E-I-R. Like, I don't think that at all. I, I've done it once before, and I literally go straight on it, going, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. That was autocorrect. And I go, was it, Gail? Was it really? I was like, it was. I promise you, I always spell there correctly. <laughs> well... <laughs> What about in your private life, Gail, um, in terms of feeling threatened or uncomfortable in certain situations? Because I think these are the things that we really need to be talking about now more yeah. than ever. Um, and I've always been, and I'm not trying to just say this and make myself look good, but, you know, because I'm a DJ by, by craft and that's what I, what, I, what I used to do. <laughs> Hopefully I'll do it again someday. And when you DJ, you're often on a raised platform. You have full scope of the whole room. You're trying to read the room anyway to soundtrack it. And I've just seen over all my years DJing the worst kind of behavior in men towards women in bars and clubs. And I do always say, I'll like, if I see somebody who's just being an asshole, then I'll float by the girl and sort of whisper, if you want me to tell like the security to get this guy to leave you alone, just give me the, the thumbs up and I will. And I've done that several times because, you know, I want people at my nights to be having a good time and I want the vibe to be positive and pleasant. And but at the same time, I don't want to live in a world where you can't approach a stranger and talk to them. You know, and it's a fine line between like leering and being gropey and gross and intimidating and awkward and just going up to a stranger and striking up a conversation. So I think these are definitely the sort of topics we need to be exploring more, um, you know, to try and set boundaries for people and educate people and how to engage with not just the other sex, but the same sex as well. But what's your experience has been over the years as a woman out and about in the big, wide, <laughs> nasty world? Um, oh, I'm not. A... Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, hold on. Rewind. Go. Is that good? Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I think like clubs and gigs and stuff, that's a really difficult thing for women because you are all up close and personal with lots of people, but some people do take advantage, like we'll have a bit of a grope of your bum or something. I've had that at gigs before. And um, usually I will turn around and go, do you know what? Not today, mate. I'm Scottish. Do not even, not that Scottish has got anything to do with it, but I always go, I've got two second down black belts and I'm Scottish and I'm small, so I'm, I'm going to win. Um, but some people, <laughs> yeah, but some people, you know, I know a lot of friends of mine that would be intimidated by that, but yep. I mean, I, I've had it a few times. I actually saw a whole bunch of kids up the road the other day there and um, they were like making fun of me being bold and I just walked back up to them. I said, sorry, what did you say? 
and the old, <laughs> it's like six of them like that. And I was like, no, seriously, say it to my face, say it to my face. And now I, I went up this morning and they were like, all right, Miss Porter, how are you? <laughs> I win. <laughs> I and think it's. I love that about you. But as you mentioned, I mean, not everybody has that confidence, sure. do they? And, and, and that's a, a great quality to possess. And, you know, part of it, I think, is teaching people to stand up for themselves. Um, but then the other part is it's teaching people to not say horrible things in the first place, isn't it? But you, also, you can't sometimes because you don't know how crazy people are. So like those kids, they literally shit themselves when I went back and they were like, sorry, sorry, sorry. But then you could meet a complete nutter who might just attack you for, you know, so you've got to be so careful. You know, I do get nervous, um, even on the tube. I was on the tube the other day there and there was nobody on the tube. It was it's like ghost town London yeah. so um, I was sitting and then this one guy got on and sat right opposite me and just stared at me and I got off I was like I have to get off because he, he made me so nervous I thought you're on you're on a vehicle going under tunnels with one bloke just sitting staring at you and he obviously he was not right because no no man in the right mind would sit and stare at a woman on the tube <laughs> on their own so that I mean things like that scare me I do get scared but um I just I don't know you can't spend your entire life being worried. But I don't even like going jogging. I, I go jogging in my park and I think about what happened to, you know, um, Sarah. And you just think, like, I mean, it could happen to anybody. He was a police officer, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah, that's the most fucked up thing about it all, isn't it? And his missus was arrested as well. I mean, I don't know. I just, I don't want to know. I just think that poor girl just walking home, that was it. And some whatever... No, I don't know. It really upsets me. I keep saying to my daughter, I was like, just carry a knife. She went, no, mum, that's illegal. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't want to worry you too much because um, right. you obviously probably worry yourself enough. But do you what do you think about that, being a mum and having a young daughter? Oh, all the time, all the time. Literally, if she goes to her dad, she's like, oh, just jump in the tube. I will not let her. <laughs> she's 18. She's like, mum, when are you going to stop? And I was like, never going to stop. Not until the day I die. If you come to London, then yeah. Because she's like, dad's in Sussex, I'm in London. So she's always traveling. But I will, you know, he's he's a bit more calm than I am. Whereas I will be at the train station and I will make sure. <laughs> in fact, I went to the train station to drop her off. She was going to see her um, um, her dad. <laughs> and the guy at the train station was like, do, do you want to go and give her another cuddle, Gail? <laughs> I mean, she's mortified. She's not even waving at me. She's like, like go away. Because, <laughs> you know, 18-year-olds, they think they, they know everything, but they don't. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I'm 35 and my mum's still the same. She's still like that with me, oh. literally. Like, she's like, every time I see her, she's like, let's have a hug, like we're being reunited after months apart. <laughs> oh, can I borrow your mum? I don't have one. Well, I did have one, but I don't. So I'll, I'll borrow your mum and dad. That'd be great. I mean, that's been, I have to you know and obviously i know you lost your dad this year which has been obviously a, a horrible thing for you to deal with but that's one of the things that i've really had to focus on this year is this downtime has been a drag for so many reasons but you have to look at the positive and it's been so lovely for me to spend time like i'm at my dad's house now and i've been living with my parents for the last can dad interview eight, you know uh, he's not here at the moment oh, so man. sadly not which is probably a good thing because yeah my, i mean my dad's kind of inquisitive anyway so even just in... he's probably about my age then <laughs> no no he's way older than you he's about 68 all right 18 he's got 18 years on me all right yeah 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 he's 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 old he's old and um yeah it's just been lovely like spending time with them as much as they drive me a little bit mad because i'm like i'm 35 as i said you can't i think deny the uh the eternal sense of just needing to protect and nurture your your offspring as a parent it's just a yeah. natural inbuilt feeling isn't it i think i think the older you get as well you i mean i literally appreciate everything everything like my neighbor waving at me happy i'm delighted that's made my day <laughs> just people being kind and you know i think because i don't have mum or dad it kind of um i want to say to people take every minute cuddle them as much as possible don't get embarrassed if they're going to give you a cuddle because you know what it's not always going to be there does it feel strange when you make the transition um, from being the child to now, obviously, your parents are no longer here, the oldest in the family? Is there a shift that goes on? Obviously, I know this is a big landmark year for you with being 50 as well. And 
again, I don't want to bum you out on your birthday, but if you do, uh, (laughs) (laughs) spoil it for me, Matt. Thanks. Like it, it must have been quite the year in terms of the things you've been processing, you know, with the grief of losing your dad, with obviously, you, you know, you now being parentless, turning 50. Well, do you know what? My mom and dad were, um, they weren't very um, touchy-feely mums and dads. You know, they weren't cuddly type things, you know. Um, so you get home from school and go, oh, I've just got a great report card or something. They go, well done. Oh. <laughs> so I, I literally am the opposite to mum and dad. So they are kind of like, they'll shake your hand. <laughs> Whereas me, I'll cuddle anybody. Obviously not now, but literally I will cuddle anyone. If someone starts crying in the street, I'll cuddle them. Whereas my mum and dad are a bit like, well done, go to your room. <laughs> Okay, so, um, but yeah, it's weird because um, my daughter always says to me, she's like, mum, I know your mum and dad were not very cuddly, but my God, you're needy. <laughs> I'm like, cuddle me, please. She's like, oh, God, I make team. I was like, look, you will miss me one day. And she's like, oh God, don't put the guilt on me. I was like, yeah, I can't cuddle. <laughs> I'm the worst parent ever. I literally would do anything for my daughter. Well, that makes you the best parent ever, not the worst. Right. <laughs> I think it makes yeah. her embarrassed. She's like, that. Off. she's <laughs> just it, she's just in that time frame isn't she where you know the last thing you want to be seen to be doing is cuddling your parents but that'll yeah. that'll come and go no exactly i don't she does kind of like a cuddle eventually but um i think the um more the more that she's sort of like getting ready to go to university and got a boyfriend and all the rest of it i'm kind of like an afterthought but i think she does think about me and she's like oh mom shall i sign you up for a dating website no, because I'll get murdered, all right? <laughs> yeah, I can't even begin to try and unpack those things. I've got a couple of friends who've actually ended up getting married to the people that they met on them. So there's definitely like... Which you know, ones the, to go on, though? I don't know which ones to go on. I, I've never been on one in my life. And, and you don't I, need to. You're a handsome chap. Well, I'm. thank you very much, Gail. Thank you very much. But I, I don't really date. I certainly haven't in the last few years. I've just been like head down, concentrating on me and my my career quote unquote i don't really look at it as a career because i like doing what i do so it doesn't feel like work but yeah i'm pretty i'm really happy on my own and i thought at the beginning of lockdown like oh my god this is going to be the worst year ever it's i didn't know it's going to be a year obviously but i thought this is going to be a really lonely summer this is the worst time in human history to be single in a pandemic but actually I think this is the best time to be single for me because it allows me the time to just work and do the things i want to do and I've seen so many friends whose relationships have been put under so much pressure and strain. I have known so many people that have split up or they're at each other's throats because they're in a house where, you know, it's me, a cat, and I can wave at the neighbours and then, but I kind of like chilling out on my own. I mean, don't get me wrong, everyone likes a cuddle, but I don't think I could have lasted a year (laughs) with having one person in my house. I probably, yeah, no, that wouldn't have gone down well. Are you a free spirit? I had my dad in the house for six months in a box. Have you, so, have you, have you scattered his ashes yet? No. Well, what happened was when we had um, the first break from lockdown last year. So um, I took, I've got one uncle, um, my dad's brother, and that's pretty much, and I've got cousins. So I got on the train and I took my dad up and gave it to Uncle, uncle Melvin. And so Uncle Melvin's got him on the mantelpiece. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing because it freaks me out. But yeah, they chat. Well, Uncle Melvin chats. <laughs> so he sort of like I think he's he's comforted to know that dad's there in a weird way. But makes he, sense. He started to freak me out, to be honest with you, because things were I'm all into like, you know, horror movies and stuff like that. And then suddenly like a door would open. It's obviously the wind, but my daughter would go, That's grandpa. I'm like, what? Come on, really? <laughs> so yeah, it was quite nice to get him out of the house. I've been thinking a lot about spirituality and life and death over the last couple, well, particularly over the last year with everything that's been going on. Um, I guess a lot of time on your own will do that. But yeah, I've been thinking a lot about it. What's your thoughts on the this life and the afterlife, Gail? God, I don't know. I mean, I did a program called Dead Famous for, what, three, four years? And I just literally looked for dead people in America, which I blinking love. Because when I first um, got the job, I was like, oh, I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in the afterlife. I don't believe in anything. After three years, I believe in everything. Everything. (laughs) Literally, I go to bed at night and I was like, mum, dad, anyone? Anyone here? (laughs) Don't know. I did not leave the board. 
You did. That's a bad thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. Well, we, me and my friend Jesse do another podcast, and we just interviewed literally last week a Russian Orthodox priest um, who w- w- worked with, have you seen the movies, The Conjuring and Annabelle and The Nun and yeah. all of those? So the couple that those films are all based around their investigations into the paranormal, the Warrens, Ed and Lorraine Warren, this guy used to work with them. Um, he used to work in their museum with them and, you know, went on cases with them and has witnessed exorcisms and all kinds of stuff. And now he's a full on Orthodox priest because everything that he saw, you know, made him believe in good and bad and and all of it. Um, and the one thing he said to us was, do not go messing with those powers. That was kind of his words of warning. Yeah. So that's my word of warning to you, Gail. Thank you. Would well, you know what? It's in, it's in a cupboard because my friend said, get rid of it. And I was like, no, because I went to New Orleans and we I was um, working with a voodoo priest. And he had one and he said, if you use it for good, um, it, it's OK. But yeah, I'm not I'm not saying anyone don't buy one. I just I wanted it. It's kind of like it's like a wee museum piece. So I don't touch it now. Well, that's the <laughs> thing is, as long as you're not playing with it and actively no, 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 inviting just, those spirits in. Then I it... like I've got my shining dolls. You've seen the shining, obviously. Yeah, of course. I've got the dolls, the twin dolls. They speak to each other. Well, you, you're, that... you're interested in the macabre, aren't you, gal? That's very much your aesthetic. That's your style. I love it. I just I love things that I can't explain. So when I actually came back from doing the Dead Famous program, there was a psychic that said to me, um, you know that someone's attached themselves to you. And I was like, oh my God, really? And he's like, yeah, you've got someone. And I, there are days I think there's something in this house. Yeah. Or on <laughs> you. It's not attached to the house. But it's attached to me, yeah. <laughs> but it seems to be a friendly thing. So it's okay. It's all fine. So, um, yeah, we did amazing things. We slept in Alcatraz twice. How was that? It was amazing. It was, um, yeah. So there was, I think, five of us in total, four or five of us. And we were, because we we're all filming ourselves because it makes it more spooky. Yeah. It was yeah. A bit like, what was the, uh, the Blair Witch Project? We're running around like that, um, getting scared. But there was a lady next to me and she was in solitary confinement. I was in solitary confinement. And I could hear her. It was like what midnight, one o'clock in the morning or something. And she's like, oh, her name was Carla. Oh, my God, Gail, there is somebody in the cell with me. And I was like, oh, my God, who's in the cell? She's like, it's a ghost. He's a prisoner. He wants to have sex with me, not you. I was like, uh, oh, right. <laughs> I can't even get laid by a ghost. I was like, what? How is <laughs> and she did the same as well because we went to... um Jim Morrison, where Jim Morrison stayed in LA in that little motel. And we yeah, went, yeah. and so we were doing our seance. And then she <laughs> how we, we, we literally had to cut everything out of our filming because I didn't stop laughing. She's like, oh, Jim, <laughs> we're like, he's, he's not there. He's not there. And she's like, <laughs> not you, Gail, just me. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, literally every ghost wants to have sex with Carla, but not me. <laughs> It's funny people like that, I think, and it was interesting talking to this priest that we had on because I think there are, the people like the one you're describing do massively discredit these things in that world because they're clearly just total phonies that yeah. are like in it for all the wrong reasons, um, you know, the, the least day. spiritual yeah. kind of people ever. Every day she got possessed. There was somebody oh, yeah. else. She li- only famous people. <laughs> she never yeah, yeah, got- yeah. And they only <laughs> ever wanted to be with her and nobody else, of course. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Jim Morrison wants to have sex. Everyone wants to have sex with me, and they're all famous. And you're like, what about Bob from across the street? No, no. no. He only wants me. <laughs> Did you work a lot in America? Did you kind of break the states in any way? Because that was always the thing, wasn't it? When you, when you were trying to chip away at the the entertainment industry was UK, then US, and you know, so few British presenters have done it, haven't they? Throughout the last twenty odd years. Yeah, I mean, we, that show didn't go out in the States. We just, we were like backwards and forwards every month just to film out there. But um, it's too big, America. I mean, I don't get me wrong. I love America. Um, not all of it. I've had some of the most amazing fun times um, and met the most crazy people. But um, I was always very happy to come home. I think San Francisco was one of my favorite places. Never been. Would love to go. San Francisco, New Orleans. I went to New Orleans before they had that awful... Katrina, yeah. Yeah, so um, I was there. And that was, in fact, I got tattooed there. That was my first ever tattoo. So um, I was walking. <laughs> my director said to me, 
Right, Gail, we're going to go and do a quick recce, going to check out some locations that we're going to be filming in. Do not speak to strangers. I'm a grown-up, but they know how to deal with me. They're like, don't speak to strangers, don't make friends. And so, of course, and they were, don't go down to the, the really bad bit of New Orleans. So I was like, so basically, speak to people that you don't know, go to the bad bit. So I did all the things I wasn't supposed to do. And there was a voodoo priest. and he Is that a bit of a common thread in your life? Yeah. <laughs> If someone says don't do it, I'm like, oh, doing it. Don't touch that. Really? You'll be getting that Ouija board out the second I'm off the Zoom, won't you? Go on. <laughs> You're but, in um, New Orleans. Yeah, and I walked, and this guy was like, it was his 60th birthday, and he's like, oh, you know when people just, I don't know. He he said to me, he's like, there's something about you, and I thought, yeah, yeah, whatever. And he said, no, no, I'm a voodoo priest. Um, have you got a tattoo? And I went, no. He went, do you want me to tattoo you? It's my 60th birthday. And I went, okay, yeah. <laughs> so like three hours later i turn up to the director who's like got everything ready to start filming she's like why have you got a bandage on i was like well so basically right you know where you told me not to go i went there and then a voodoo priest tattooed me and they were like oh my god oh my god why i was like i don't know just felt like the, <laughs> felt like the right thing to do so i've got a huge big dragon on my arm he designed he designed it himself and that was your first you went in big no messing around big tattoo did it hurt I'm i've only got a couple of little tattoos nothing hurts me nothing oh yeah well mean mean people do but no like things like that no. physically physically you're, you're hard as nails <laughs> i've got so many now don't even know what they mean <laughs> to be honest mentally you're pretty hard as nails as well although you're a very soft caring lovely person you're a survivor aren't you gal kind of yeah i i think um i've been dealt the odd tricky hand in life so um but yeah i'm still here so far <laughs> yeah and the world is a much better place because of it oh you don't make me cry not on my birthday seriously no. <laughs> can you share with me a rock and roll anecdote from your book have you got any really good crazy stories you know, of a i have not written about any people in my book have but... you not is that no. to, is that to protect the guilty <laughs> I, just, I feel a bit like um I'm it's not a kiss and tell kind of thing no, I, I'm quite happy to tell my story and I've had amazing friends and, and relationships in my, you know, my lifetime. But I think that um, if I, I, I would feel bad about if I wrote about somebody else. I think, yeah, I'm quite happy telling everybody how mad I am or stuff that happened. But rock and roll stories, I don't know, really. I mean, Top of the Pops, that was great fun. I lived with Keith Flint. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I've been very lucky. Yeah, he was an amazing man, wasn't he? Yeah, he was, yeah. By all accounts. Yeah. Did you never meet him? No, I wish I did. He was, yeah, yeah, one of a kind. They were the band that sort of changed everything for, for my age group. When that video came out, smacked my bitch up, everybody was like, oh, my God, what is this? You know, it was like the Sex Pistols married with rave music super just dangerous visuals i did a podcast recently with jonas ackerland who did oh, the right. smack my smack my bitch up music video for them and um yeah they were just such a force and they they continued to be you know they'd play download festival with some of the heaviest bands in the rock and metal world and you know not only would they hold their own but they'd they'd go toe to toe and in many instances outstage many of the other acts on the bill just with the you know the ferocity and power which they brought to every gig Live. I mean, ridiculous. They were just, <laughs> it was just, it was endless energy on that stage, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah. That's another lifetime ago, isn't it? But, yeah, that was sad. That was very sad. Were you still in touch over the years after you? Not really. Because no, no. he, got, he got married and, um, yeah, and then she went off. I think she went back to Japan. I think she was a DJ. I'm not entirely sure. And um, I, the occasional message, but nothing major, really. So, um, yeah, that was sad. But um, good times, though. And they're still, I mean, Prodigy are still doing amazingly well. Still performing and all that. I've not seen, yeah. I'm, I'm desperate to go to a gig anywhere. What was, the what was the last gig you went to? I was trying to think about that, you know. I think it was um, probably Hyde Park. I went to see Florence with my daughter. Very she, nice. 
Yeah, she was a big fan of Florence and the Machine. Oh no, actually, that's a complete lie. That was just before, and then I went to see Nadine Shaw in um, the Roundhouse. Do you know Nadine? No. Oh, she's great, amazing. She's uh, amazing. So she had a gig at the Roundhouse, and um, I went there, and Brick Smith was there, you know, from the fall. Yeah, so- Brick's has been on this show. Yeah, she's lovely, isn't she? Lovely. She's um, amazing, and I've, her book I've I haven't finished, but I've been reading, and it's again what a life, what an incredible story. I know, she's a yeah, she's a because literally I think that was about so it was just before I went to pick up my dad from Spain. I think it was the day before, and it was just about lockdown time, and we were all thinking, what's going on? We don't know. And um, yeah, Nadine was playing, and yeah, I think that was the last gig I actually did go and see at the Roundhouse. I do love Camden. Yeah, well, I used to DJ week in, week out at the World's End. I remember. Uh, That was my life for, you know, a good couple of years, and it's one of the i mean it's it is changing and it is getting gentrified and it is slowly becoming like the rest of the world but camden was one of the spots in london that seemed to retain and hold on to its sense of individual unique character for the longest Um, now there's that box thing there though i think that will all change soon enough and you know like the kind of box park they have in shoreditch they've got one of those in camden now so i'm sure that will you know hipsterize the whole area the last thing I, I did in Camden was I went to Camden Rocks. Yep. Oh, I've lost you again. There we go. No. I hate this. Do you know what? It's like, A, you can't see real people. You can't hug anybody. And then when you actually get to see your friends, then it just breaks down. The fucking internet crashes and ruins everything. <laughs> I know. Have you tried switching it on and off again? Yeah, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get yourself a better service provider, it seems, Gail. Have a word. Have a word. Do you know what? I was trying to watch Murder this morning. Not like real life murder. Yeah, and it said your internet's not working. I was like, oh, come on, really? It's my birthday, you dicks. <laughs> so the last thing you were saying was Camden Rocks, which is a yearly event ran by my good friend Chris McCormack who was in the band Three Colours Red back in the day. Um, Yeah. And so, I mean, I think it was a three-day event the last time it happened. I think you've taken it up to three. Because that was the time that I met the Asylums. Do you know the band, the Asylums? Um, Don't know them personally, but yeah, heard the name. Fantastic. And so basically I was just wandering around. I hadn't bought a ticket, so I'm really sorry to your friend. And... um, (laughs) So I was uh, literally, um, I was just passing Camden Tube Station and these guys came out, um, Luke's got lovely big hair and um, they went, are you, are you Gail? And I went, oh God, yeah. And they went, oh, you know our friend Danny Watson, who used to run a club in Notting Hill, Death by Disco with Alan McGee. And um, they were like, oh yeah, he, he's managing us. And I was like, oh, right. And they had all these equipment. And I went, do you want me to carry something? And they went, yeah, if you don't mind. <laughs> so Instant these, like, roadie for the band, love it. <laughs> these strapping big lads going, yeah, if you, you can carry that. And so I carried, I went, but can I get into your gig then? And they were like, yeah, yeah, sure. If you carry that, it's fine. I just pretended I was with them. I was like, I'm with a band. It was like almost famous. You know that movie? <laughs> yeah. Right. But that's going yeah. back now. So that must have been like uh, right. June 2019, right? yeah it was like wow. three, three four years ago three years ago well Maybe. gail when shows are a thing again i've got to take you to one you've got to get to more gigs oh my god i can't wait I, i'm just so excited i got honey tickets to go to reading this year because yeah. queen stone age are playing um um but i don't know if that's going to happen or not i mean i don't like saying on public platforms that it's not because i don't want to take the wind out of anybody's sail and i enjoy seeing the festival selling out and people getting excited for it but I think when I see one event happen, then I'll believe all the rest are going to go ahead. But until then, I reserve all excitement. Because, yeah, I bought her tickets before, obviously, all this happened. And I bought tickets for her and her three mates. But one of them said, oh, I'm not sure if she can go. And I was like, excellent. Shoe in. And Honey was like, no, 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 you're not coming. And I was like, oh, come on, really? And I was like, yeah, but I'm really, I'll, I'll be really quiet. You will never hear a sound. I'll, I'll disappear. I'll probably get tattooed by a, a weird, like, random... Do you know, when was the last time you were at Redding, Gail? <laughs> oh, my God. It was actually 
the prodigy were playing so what early 2000s oh god i can't remember because i forgot that i was supposed to be on um good morning britain whatever it was called at the time and i got um a message from somebody saying oh you're um there's a car to take you to tv <laughs> and what? you're in a field having it large having it large watching <laughs> the party, like one o'clock i think it's midnight we were still partying yeah and i was going no you've, you've got to you've got to go to work <laughs> i literally turned up probably stinking bit of mud on the shoes getting everywhere in the studio oh no gal you froze again fourth time's a charm gal fourth time's a charm oh my god i'm so sorry i'm so sorry it might just have to be like s slow subtle movements <laughs> it's weird isn't it i don't know what causes it's going to overdrive but yeah sorry you were saying you were about to go to the studios from reading to be on good morning television yeah and I, I i don't know if it was lorraine or something like that but i i, I remember i was just like oh my god i'm stinking and i have just watched the prodigy play and they want me to talk about jedward and i was like i don't even know i was on for about 30 seconds i'd come all the way back from reading didn't get paid and i went on to talk about jedward i don't Amazing. actually remember what was going on i was like i don't know what's happening <laughs> Well, you're one of those people who, and there's only a few of them, who kind of seamlessly managed to transition back and forth without changing um, from the mainstream to the alternative. You know, I think most people, for me, as somebody who's like a quote unquote in the alternative side of things, um, it's interesting when, you know, you see certain people try and enter that alternative world from the mainstream and you're like, you're just faking it. I can tell that you're not interested in this at all. Whereas you obviously love rock music and fashion and, you know, all the things that come with the territory, but then you can be Absolutely. on the most commercial. Well, you know, you, you've always got the great frog jewelry going on. You're a rock and roller. There you go. Do you know what they sent me this one? You see that it says mum on it. Amazing. They sent me that for Mother's Day. Ah. Oh. It was a gift from them because I'm always wearing all this. So, um, yeah. So that's you, very you're, you're part of the crew, um, but then you can go and be on the, you know, what's the other one loose women you can go and be on shows like that as well <laughs> um yeah no uh no i have i have done interviews on there before and bless them it's fine but it's not my kind of telly no but you but can I, I, get, I, I get very excited about just doing stuff i'm just happy to be alive to be honest with you um you know i've lost so many friends through the years and you know lost my parents and so i don't know i just find everything unless i really really dislike something i'll turn up and i'll be the smiliest person ever might not be having the best time but i'll go oh do you know what it's another day keep smiling whatever yeah i've been talking a lot over the last year about like coping mechanisms and trying to and just in my own private personal life as well i've been very much on this i think quest of self-discovery and trying to find out who i am in these crazy times um What's your sort of go-to approach, methodology, techniques um, for, you know, keeping spirits high and, and remaining hopeful and joyful in the face of adversity and struggle? Do you know what? Um, just honey, my daughter, literally, I've got, even when she's not here, I've got pictures everywhere. She's like, oh my God, mom, take them down. But do you know what? I just think, because I was told I can never have children. And so... You know, I thought I was really, really unwell. And I went to the doctors and they were like, oh, we think you've got gastroenteritis. <laughs> and literally, I was like told I had all sorts of things. And then suddenly I was like, I think, I think I'm pregnant. They're like, no, you can't be pregnant. You you can't. And uh, yeah, so every time I look at honey, I just think, you know, I've managed to, um, you know, did all right in the 90s, was homeless, lost my hair, lost my parents told I couldn't have a kid and um, now I've got a beautiful 18 year old. So, I mean, what's not to love? That's amazing. I'll tell you what's not, what's not to love is your internet connection. <laughs> Shit, isn't it? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am a terrible human being. I apologize. No, you're, you're the opposite of that girl. Um, so you, um, I was going to say, I, so you watched the documentary that I did. I did. Yeah. I wanted to watch it today to like completely refresh my memory because I watched it like the day it was up on the iPlayer or went out on telly. I can't remember, but I saw it immediately and was just so moved by it. And obviously, you know, I know you and some of your story, but there was those elements of, of your story that I wasn't familiar with. Um, and 
you know, A, even if I didn't know you, anybody who watches that, you just come across like the most likable, lovable, positive person. Um, that was, I think, for me, the thing that really shone through is, you know, there's obviously a great human story of triumph over adversity and, and getting through hard times and all those optimistic kind of inspiring things. But you just come across like a beam of sunshine, girl. Well, I wasn't bringing it up to be a total like, hey, check <laughs> out. I was, bring, I was bringing it up to say my That's dad was I'm in it. saying, though. My dad was in it. I know he was, yeah. And so, you, you have a very sincere moment that you can tell is real. You can tell is real because, you know, he's opening up to you and you, you're having like, it's a, it's on camera, but it's a very private, intimate, special moment, isn't it? It was really weird because people that knew my dad, right? So I said, I'm really sorry if I let you down ever. And he yeah. went, Oh, Gail, you just let yourself down. I was like, typical dad. Do you know, just say something nice. <laughs> no, then, you just let yourself down. But then he does bring you in for a hug and he goes, but you're all, but you're all right now. And that was like as emotional as it got with him, was it? Well, that, that was, I mean, I was so shocked when he gave me a hug. I was like, wow, okay, cool. And you know what, when, when he died, I got a phone call from him in the morning and he's like, oh, he always phoned me, just like, how are you doing? He was in Spain and he was, you know, living the midlife crisis man dream. And um, then I got a phone call in the evening and from his phone and I was like, oh my God, dad, you phoned me twice in one day and it was a Spanish woman going, your dad is dead. I was like, what? That doesn't make any sense. But, um, but yeah, and the thing was as well, I said to him, I said, you know what, this is BAFTA nominated shit this is, Dad. And he went, oh, you'll never win a BAFTA. And I blink and won one and he never saw it. I've never seen it, actually. It's not arrived. <laughs> I was so proud of you when I saw that and so well deserved. <laughs> it was so weird. You haven't oh seen God. it, though, you were telling me. You haven't watched the documentary <laughs> back. Well, I, obviously, when I did the voiceover, yeah. I, I saw bits and pieces, but I found it all a little bit, um, obviously, with my dad being in it, it's kind of hard. Yeah. Um, it's like watching a whole movie a bit. So, yeah, I've seen bits and pieces. I probably, if I put it all together, I have watched it, but um, I've not actually sat down and watched it as a whole program. And um, But... Uh, yeah, that was it was it was hard to do to be honest with you. And the bless the director, she put up with so much for me because it was opening so many things I didn't want to talk about. And she was just the nicest lady. And I was going, well, you can f off. And I'm not mean at any point. She was like, oh right, okay. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> I was like, oh my god, I've just like revisited my entire life. And um, my dad's going, no, it's just you. Like, Whatever. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was incredibly brave. Um, and what I did enjoy um, from a kind of voyeuristic angle was watching you get quite spiky with the psychologist. That's one of the few times I've seen you get really confrontational and you're like, so I'm that, am I? I'm, I'm that, am I? I'm borderline, am I? I'm borderline. <laughs> those poor guys, because I think I saw five different... Trying to profile you and you just not having it. No, I'm not having any of it. And they were like, I was like, oh my God, you've known me for like how many minutes? 10 minutes and you're just telling me that I'm borderline got this I've got this disorder I've got that disorder I'm depressed I'm not depressed oh it's like oh do you know what f off <laughs> so, if you imagine you've done six months of this and then suddenly it's another person that you've never met in your entire life telling you what's wrong with you and you just think oh I mean it was it was important for people to sort of acknowledge that we we've all got problems we have all got problems but I was not having him telling me what was wrong with me <laughs> I loved I was, it I was so mean. No, it, as, it, I think that's as mean as I get. Yeah, it was a new side to you that I'd seen, but it was nice because he he didn't seem offended or hurt by it. You know, I think he took it very much in his stride, and you know, it, it was just it, again a very real moment. Like the whole film is that. Sometimes you watch a documentary, and it's you know, documentary as a medium is meant to be a, you know reflection and representation of the truth, but very often these things are scripted. And you can tell it's all in the edit and the post-production and they've created a story out of, you know, a skeleton that perhaps could have gone in any different way. But with your story, it was so raw and so real throughout. And there's so many genuine moments where you're reacting to the moment in the moment in, you know, a completely honest and unrehearsed way. There was one point where we were in um, Edinburgh, in Joppa, where I was, I was born. And um, the director went, oh, can we just like, film you going past your mum's house again and I was like do you know what you can f off I was like I'm not doing it twice 
it, this is real. This is real. If I'm crying, I'm not going to redo it. This is the story. And she was like, oh, but, you know, she was trying to do the best of her job. But whereas I was like, this is a story, end of. I'm not doing anything twice. You either like it or you don't, end of. Uh, oh. well, <laughs> so she was like, I think she was a little bit scared of me because, you know, scary Scottish bald small people are quite scary. Have you seen the Crankies? I've seen <laughs> I wouldn't say I'm afraid of them, but now you put it in that light, maybe I need to revisit. <laughs> Sorry, Jeanette. That's her yeah. name, Jeanette. And, you know, I think that's why it did get get the BAFTA, you know, is because it's unflinchingly vulnerable and raw and real and emotional. And what's the, is it the, the, the moment when, is it you're at Parliament, you actually go inside, or where are you when you're doing like a talk? And that's that's one of the the most. Oh moving. yeah, I was, I was at I was in Parliament. Yeah, um, that was weird. That was very weird, actually. I got really quite sad that yeah. day, just thinking I don't want to be here. But it was for a charity, which obviously you know I love my charities, but it, I just felt a bit. I don't know. It, was, it just didn't feel right. I didn't feel like people were there for the right reasons. You know, it felt a little bit like. It was just a sort of a, a bit of a jolly for a lot of the guys that were working in Parliament to, you know, I, I'm doing a talk about the charity that I care about and they're not really that interested, to be honest with you. Just taking a selfie going, I think my gran likes you. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, isn't that it? Is, weird, is isn't sometimes it? people act almost like tourists in these worlds, whether it's mental health or, you know, misogyny, sexism, racism. There's a lot of these topics now which finally and thankfully are being explored more. But I do feel like those that haven't lived it do kind of flow in and treat it as like this fascination, you know, like an experiment. And, and it's like, no, this is real life. Yeah, it's a bit jolly for them, yeah. yeah. It's like they don't actually take on board that you've actually got feelings and you are a human being as opposed to something to look at or go, oh, yeah, I've heard about her. I'm like I'm actually a person. Yeah, and I've <laughs> lived have, this. I've lived this. This is my life. <laughs> and as much as I'm smiling now, I'll probably cry when I get home. So do you know what? Just don't make me cry. <laughs> well, one of my probably my favourite scene in exchange in the whole film is when the old producer and director of Top of the Pops comes Chris over Cameron. comes over to your flat. And, you know, my experience with like TV producers is usually quite like sleazy car salesman type kind of gross people. Obviously, I haven't got anywhere near as much experience as you. But here's this guy that comes in and he seems so genuine, so real. You two have this great, you can tell connection and chemistry and relationship. And you say, I felt like I wasn't good enough. And he says to you, you were good enough. You are good enough. Um, and the only person who can you'd say that or not is you beautiful moment and you you start welling up and such a again just a, a wonderful moment he's just one of the nicest people ever um but uh yeah because he was at top of the pops forever and he always looked after me he was just a uh, straight down the line you know he was he, he looked after people you know he made sure that you were all fine and um yeah because I, I think i was speaking to him about you know i wasn't sure if he knew what I was doing to myself at the time, whether it was not eating or cutting myself or, and, um, but when I look back on it, he was always make sure I was fine. I would make sure that that car was there to take me home. The car was there to pick me up and he didn't say anything, but you know, when people, some people don't have to say something. Yeah. You just know. So yeah, he's, he's one of life's wonderful people. There's a few, isn't there? The entertainment industry is full of, pimps and thieves and assholes but there is some really genuine sincere lovely exactly. people in in the okay. old media industry like, meet the good ones you know they're the good ones yeah not that there's lots of bad people out there but you know some people just you know you don't click with and you just think okay i've done a job end of you know so um but yeah there, there are a lot of really great people and i've met so many interesting funny warm great people i've been very very lucky God, it sounds like I've killed myself off again. <laughs> <laughs> no, practicing humility and gratitude is good. It's 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 a good way of reminding yourself what you've been through and the good things that you've experienced. And yeah, I'm constantly trying to like practice gratitude, not in a as you say, not in a eulogy kind of a way, but <laughs> it's good to acknowledge the good things in life, especially if they're hard fought. 
you know if you've been exactly. through stuff to to get there yeah no he's uh love chris curry he's amazing um i just you know i really miss things like that like top of the pops and big breakfast and fun you know when you actually watch people on the telly that are just laughing are just having fun i don't think there is much of that anymore really and if it is it's kind of like um it's very sort of um staged sycophantic as well and they're all mates everybody's mates on the telly whereas you know we used to turn up at the big breakfast no idea who was going to be there no clue whatsoever and then that was it you just laugh and laugh and laugh whereas now you sort of turn on to telly and it's like there's someone interviewing their mate or there's somebody else's mate on the telly maybe i'm just getting really old and no I, I mean let let me pull this up right i'd love to hear your thoughts on this your old friend urban welsh did this post the other day and this goes back to just the creation stories movie and and the 90s and talking about that but Irvin says and i'll kind of paraphrase because i won't go into too much oh, you know what? i think i read this yeah he says, it reminds me of the fun and freedom that we've lost in our modern age, not just with COVID, but to the crushing mediocrity and conservatism of the corporate technocracy of modern neoliberalism. And he goes on this big post yeah, about how the entertainment industry is, you know, all the risk and the art and the excitement has been sucked out of it. Um, and how kind of the working class culture has just, you know, lost itself. And An amazing post because I found Alan's film. It wasn't maybe the greatest film I've ever seen, but the energy and the pacing of it, it really brought out this strong emotion in me that reminded me of my youth, reminded me of that time. And I couldn't quite put my finger on why I was feeling those things. And then I read Irvin's post and I was like, yeah, it's that it's that rebellious spirit, which the nineties had on mainstream, you know, morning television. As you say, you turn on like the big breakfast or, you know, and you have zig and zag and these characters, like it just, it was like anarchy. It was like the lunatics were running the asylum, but it seemed innocent, you know, it wasn't a dark scene. No, I mean, I used to be on the bed and I didn't even look at the puppeteers. I was talking to Zig and Zag like they were my friends. <laughs> and they'd be going, Hi, blah, blah, blah. and I was like, so anyway, right? But, you know, and, you know, I got to interview Kermit once. So, it's like, <laughs> the dream. The but, dream. Um, yeah. My friend interviewed, I think, Kermit and Miss Piggy for Kerrang Radio. Yeah. And I saw the video and I was like, dude. How do I get them on my podcast? Obviously, with a podcast, it wouldn't work. It would sound so, pretty funny, but you need right. you need the visual there. <laughs> yeah, no, I did. Uh, where did I? Um, I actually. It, oh God, there was a great program called Wish You Were Here, which was a travel. You're probably too young. I, re I remember Wish You Were Here. It was on like Sunday evening, six p.m. That's yeah. Right. So, um, in fact, that was that. Those were the days when you actually got paid a little bit of cash, but. Um, they used to um, send you places, you know, obviously I went to Scotland a lot because I'm the only Scottish person in the world. So they just kept sending me back. But um, they sent me to the Maldives and I went with Keith Flynn and because I phoned them and I said, um, can I take a friend? And they're like, yeah, of course they paid for it, you know, because it was all paid, everything was just fun. But um, yeah, Kermit, I'd gone to <laughs> I'd gone to LA to do Wish You Were Here. And I was, at, it was the opening of um, the LA Disney whatever i don't know uh one of those big what do you call them the, the big theme parky things yeah 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 so the muppets had they had their own theater so they um so i got to interview all of them so there was um oh my god there was beaker there was the chef i mean so if that if that isn't living the dream i don't know what is that is like yeah well, I was literally, I talked to them all, like the puppets, did not even notice the people underneath. And then there was like, um, there was a party in the evening. And of course, the people were there, not the puppets. And one of the guys was like, hey, Gail, it's nice to see you again. And I was like, I don't know who you are. And he went, it's me, it's Kermit. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> he was the he was like, oh, I didn't even recognize you. He went, you didn't even look at us. <laughs> you were talking to the puppets. And I was like, they're not puppets, they're real. And he's like, oh, bless you. Do you know what that is, though, Gail? There's a beautiful... Um... <laughs> you've always retained that innocence and excitement of youth, you know, which often I see, I try and retain it in my own way as well, but often you see people as they grow old and, you know, mature and life beats you down. A lot of people lose that wonder, oh, no. that, set, that sense of play. And you, you, you've you always had that about you, always. Well, honestly, my postman today, and he was like, why are you still waving at me, Gail? I was like, hi! And he's like, yeah, I know it's your birthday. What? You see me every day. I know, but it's exciting, isn't it? And he's like, not really. Ah, oh, what a grump. Yeah, it's exciting. 
And I've actually got my um, Darth Vader, or oh, you wouldn't even like this, um, Dave Prowse, bless him, God rest his soul, he signed me a picture of him as, as Darth Vader. Well, by like, all accounts, I've got a friend who's like a Welsh musician who's good friends with Dave. Uh, and by all accounts, he was an absolute gentleman, like total sweetheart. Did you know him as well or just a, I, a brief I, encounter? I went to his house for tea with him and his wife. And he gave me like books, um, Star Wars books, mugs, everything. Uh, and I didn't even really know him. He just knew I was a massive Star Wars fan. And he knew somebody who knew somebody who knew me. And then we all went for tea and sat in his garden. Oh. Okay even happen it was like the real the deal thing kermit darth vader oh my god there's a running theme here that people aren't actually real <laughs> 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 oh god oh that's quite tragic <laughs> what's your plans for tonight you got any uh zoom party action happening or a couple of facetimes or calls or yeah do you know what um uh yeah my friends were like oh come over and i said you can't come over that's you can't. We've done a year. You're not coming over. So I think I'm going to do um, Zoom calls. Um, I got a nice message from Scroobius Pip this morning. Nice. I think he's in America somewhere or Canada or something. Yeah, I think Stu said he's in Canada working on a new show. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, I got a message about 3 a.m. saying happy birthday, which was really nice. And um, so I think I might chat to Stu later on. And nice. Boys and, Give him yeah. my love. Yes, they're such good fun, aren't they? The best. Papa Jay. Yeah. Do you know Big Jay? I don't know him personally, but he was there the day that we did the live podcast. He was obviously one of the other guests that day. And I was just like, I, that was the first day I met Rich Wilson as well, who I know better than, oh, I than Jay. Him. I love Rich too. But yeah, that guy, Jay, I was like, this dude is out there. He is a real character. Like, I don't know whether he's playing a role or he's just no, like no, this no. all the time. I still don't know what he actually does. To be honest yeah. with you. <laughs> I know that he's very successful, whatever he does, but he's just big Papa Jay. So um, I think they're going to uh, Zoom call me this evening. So that'll be quite interesting. So they've got a karaoke machine. I don't have a karaoke machine. That's all I've ever wanted. I can't sing, but I just always wanted a karaoke machine. So I might buy myself one online. Well, you should have put it on the wish list for the big five oh. Should have done, should have done. Are you gonna pop some of those champagne bottles that are on the floor? You're gonna have some of those tonight? No, I don't think so because I feel like champagne is such like it's you know, it's quite posh. So you yeah. should kind of like have Share it. With the... you today. Yeah. yeah. I, I think, you know, there's Prosecco in the, the other room. So there you um, go. actually do you know that that was sent by you no, know, there was wine and, and it was sent by the guys that had cunning stunts to say sorry happy birthday really this year <laughs> that was, hang on that was 1999 mate but yeah was, you know <laughs> 22 years later and prosecco as well not even champagne no, not even champagne prosecco and wine there was some red wine but you know i'll, I'll i think i'm going to distribute some bottles around the neighborhood and oh. not to children but to the grown-ups yeah the pied piper of the street yeah, that used to be my nickname at school, the Pied Piper, because like I turn up not to school, sorry, after I left school, if I went somewhere, you could guarantee I'd just go out for coffee on my own, and by the end of the evening, there's about twenty of us. So I go, how did that happen, Gail? I went, I don't know. <laughs> just talk to everybody. Come on, join in. Yeah, it's because you, you give off good energy, Gail. It's good to be around you. It's it fun is. to be around you. Yeah. And then they call me the Pied Piper of Soho when I moved to Soho. Don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah, it would have been. We're talking about like the light-hearted side of Soho, <laughs> not the dark, seedy underbelly. I remember, I remember <laughs> Soho for seven years. Yeah, I loved when it, it. When it was popping, I'm sure. It was great. You go out for a coffee in the morning and go back about three days later with a whole bunch of folk that you didn't know. <laughs> not good times. Do you, you know. <laughs> do you think that when the world reopens, people are going to have a sense of wonder about life again? I feel like we've been losing and lacking that in more recent years. Do you think when it opens up again, people are going to finally realise that socialising and real life one on one time and human connection and all these simple things that we take for granted are actually what makes the world go round? Do you think we're going to realise that finally? I get back to it. Hope. I blink in hope so. I really do. I think everyone should, you know, we've had a horrible horrible year and um i just think god wouldn't it be just nice if people just appreciated everything everything you know even the guy that was like drilling outside the house at 8 a.m i was like oh well i could be angry but i didn't i went and gave him a cup of tea i was like oh you're doing a job it's all right i just want people to be happy and think you know life is way too short to be miserable and grumpy and you know we all have to be safe be kind but yeah just have some fun enjoy everything 
because it's not going to happen again, is it? I'll drink to that, Gail. <laughs> Cup of tea, mate, yeah? Peppermint tea. Nice. <laughs> They're words to live by right there. Um, and uh, we, we will have to go for a drink in April. We'll find an outdoor pub. Um, I'm going to yeah. come down and do a few days in London, do some podcasts and, and well, get, some, get you some know what? I've just on. booked a table. So I didn't even know who I was booking it for. I just booked a table at Hush, which is a restaurant just off Bond Street. My friend does it. And he's like, who are you coming with? I don't know. Don't know yet. Just got to get in there. Just got in there. I booked the table you're for You're going to be fully booked soon, aren't you? So I've got to get in. <laughs> Do you know well, what? That will probably happen. I, I've spoke to a lot of people who are in the hospitality industry and, you know, some of them are f fully booked for like the first two, three, four weeks from when they open round the clock just because I think people are literally like after a, it's a year today, isn't it? Not only are you 50 today, but a year yeah, ago today we went into lockdown. Because I came back with my dad in the box. So, right, this is the last thing. It's not funny, but it is kind of funny. So I was sitting at the back of the plane with my dad. Um, he's got his ashes. And I, I put him in a bag that said happy on it because I didn't want people to know that I had a dead body in a box. So um, I was sitting there and um, this lovely air hostess came up to the back of the plane. She was like, it's Gail, isn't it? And I was like, yeah, yeah. And she said, oh, you were on a flight ages ago and you were like, being really nice to one of the attendants that were do you want to go up to first class? And I was like, well, it's from Spain. It's not like first class, you know, just a bigger seat. And I'm only five foot one. But um, I said, yeah, sure. And he said, oh, she went, oh, we've got two seats. And I went, oh, perfect. So I can bring my dad. And the guy next to me at the back, he went, sorry, what? And I was like, oh, yeah, oh, that's my dad. And he's like, oh, God, please. And I was like, do you want to, do you want to go to first class? He's like, no, you, no, God, no, you, what? And I was like, oh, yeah. So I put my dad on first class. And then the lady came up and she's like, I'm not entirely sure how to deal with this. So I've got you two wee bottles of red wine, one for you, one for your dad. <laughs> oh, my dad's never flown first class before. She's like, right. I was like, oh my God, this is just like so weird. Only me. <laughs> Do you know what though? That right there, that little story is life in a nutshell. There's so, <laughs> there's so many elements to that story which just touch me right in the heartstrings and it's perfect. He never flew first class. The one time he does is his last flight. In a box. In a box because from Spain. In a in a pandemic. <laughs> you couldn't make that shit up, could you really? You couldn't. And is that how the book's gonna <laughs> is that the end of the book right there? Yeah. Amazing. It is actually it's at the end. It is at the end. So um because I had written it. To, <laughs> so when I first started it, it said two mum, two dad, to my brother. So then I fell out with my brother, my mum died, my dad died. So I was just like <laughs> just to the cat. To honey. I don't know who the book's for. It. To honey, yeah. I was like, no, you can't read it, honey. You can't read it. It's all probably out there on the internet, isn't it? Is there is there, is there anything so. is there anything in the book that hasn't yet been like divulged and shared? And is there a few little nuggets that you've held back? I did write a whole load of stuff about when I was section stuff that people didn't know about. So um, yeah, that was that was hard. I think that's when I set fire to something, but um, I kept it back in. I rewrote it. So there's yeah, there's lots of stuff personal wee things you know nothing <laughs> nothing explosive my life is not that exciting but you know um feelings there's a lot of feelings that i've written down you know yeah. um with mental health and and sadness and happiness and you know so um yeah that's about as exciting as it gets really Matt. <laughs> well no that but there's nothing more affecting than just unbridled honesty and you know, you've always been a champion for, for these subjects, which are now finally getting the attention they deserve. And, you know, when you when you reveal the things that you've experienced and been through in such a way, it speaks to people and, and helps them. And, and you've, you've obviously seen that over the, the years and you know that. And if I can give you any piece of like, for what it's worth advice in, in regards to the book is really do just, if you're comfortable with doing it, be as courageous as you can and put it all in there because all the best books that I've read that have touched me the most and inspired me the most have been the ones that, you know, the jaws on the floor with the level of the peeling back of the skin and, you know, how how exposed and raw and, and honest it gets. They're always the best ones, exactly. if you can. You need to send me yours, or I'll just buy it. Obviously, I'll buy it online. No, I'll br but, I'll um, bring you a copy down when I see you. I'll come down and I'll bring you a copy. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, and I will be down in a few weeks. So. Yeah, well, let me know, and uh, we'll go for a drink somewhere outdoors. Yeah, hundred percent.
I'm so sorry that we've had like a shitty connection type thing, but we got there in the end. We got there in the end, and I'll just take out those gaps, and nobody will be any the wiser. Thank you so much. It's really nice to see you. You too. And thank um, you, for me. Thank you for talking. No, <laughs> sorry, you cut <laughs> up again. Gail, the pleasure is always, always mine. Um, and thank yeah, you th thank you for being you. We're uh, we're a richer world with you in it, Gail. Thank you for celebrating my birthday with me. Peppermint teas all round. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see my mug as well? You don't even like, appreciate anything. Oh, yeah, it's a Star Wars reference, isn't it? I just love Star Wars. Literally love Star Wars. I can watch it over and over. It's like I said to you. So I've got Star Wars, if I'm sad. Um, Harold and Maud, which is my favourite Now film. that I can get down with. That's a top five all-time film for me. Love it. Love it, love it. I can watch it. I can watch, happily watch it every day. I love it, love it, love it. And if I'm feeling really depressed, I watch Anchorman just because it's so stupid. Yeah. So stupid. You just think, oh, I just want to be in that film. And hang out with those characters. <laughs> yeah. I love Lamp. Yeah, I know you do. <laughs> I'm going to play out this podcast because I like to come in and out of the podcast with 30 seconds of a right. song relating to the guest. And I'm going to finish this podcast with the Cat Stevens song off the Harold and Maud soundtrack. If you want to sing out, sing out. And if you want to be free, be free. be free. The best. There's a million ways to be. You know that there are. So good. First time I saw that film, I just wept and wept and wept. Happy tears. Um, if nobody's seen it, watch it this, this week. It will change your life for the better. Harold and Maud. So good it's just the best and the soundtrack amazing just uh, everything about it is just it's like a hug in a movie it, well the first time i saw the only time i saw cat stevens live i was front row with my friend ryan and we were the youngest people there by you know a good 20 years everybody there was sort of 60 and above then this was 10 years ago um and he goes this next song is from a film that uh, i did some songs in and me and my friend were like oh, we'd had a, we'd had a few we were those people and i was really excited so i'm there on the front row going Harold and Maud. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, it's Harold and Maud. Thanks for that. <laughs> All these old Cat Stevens fans are glaring at me like, shut up. Don't sing along. <laughs> shut up. Shut up it's, just, um, it's just the best. I've got it on my headphones. I, I've got the soundtrack. So if I'm having a bad day and I'm on the tube, I'm just like, pop that on. I've got certain songs that I go to and I just think I'm not having the best day. That's one of the albums that I always listen to. And also I listen to It's a Sin just because it reminds me of like the 80s and 90s. Did you watch it? It's a Sin. No, that I've seen a lot of people tweeting. So the pictures is all of them kind of in the pastel suits and dresses in a car. And it's a very 80s shot. And that's like okay. the cover. Yeah, I've seen that image shared by so many people whose opinions I value. So I need to get on it. Is it a series? It's um I oh I don't know how many episodes it was um but I watched it all in one one night and it, I cried I laughed I cried I laughed it's you know is that is that good is it it's fantastic and also I mean I lost a few friends to HIV and AIDS and it it's just watch it it, it just reminds me of the eighties nineties you know no one was caring and then suddenly we got hit by you know. HIV. It's, it's almost like no, with it's not. But you know what I mean. It's like there's, there's definitely parallels. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So it's kind of you know we didn't know anything about it until suddenly you were like, oh, yeah, losing people, thinking, oh my god, this is a this is a real thing. So um, yeah, don't get me crying on that one as well. Jesus Christ, you really ruined my birthday, haven't you? I'm fucking. <laughs> gonna get off the zoom and just go right i'm oh, gonna i'm reflecting i'm gonna reflect about all the amazing friends that i still have and i had so um yeah and yeah but it's a, it's a great soundtrack it really is it's so fantastic and actually i'm going to do um a radio show with um janice long on, on bbc radio wheels so i think we're doing that thursday but we're trying to get um frankie goes to hollywood the power of love it should not just be a christmas song it should be a song all the time you know yeah, it's it a song about love isn't it and survival it seems to sort of like bring it out every christmas but it's not a christmas song so we're all for petitioning to just get people to play it all the time because it's the best song are you still doing your radio show is that still happening yeah i'm uh, islington radio yeah i'm loving it absolutely loving it i'm doing it with tom bright um who's a singer songwriter 
a great guy and it's just so weird because we've got a tiny studio and we've both got our masks on and play music so we can't even like have a hug or we can't it's it's, just, it's most bizarre but it's great I love it I really enjoy it and we just get to play whatever we want to be honest with you when and how can people listen to that it's on Mixcloud um so you can listen to it anytime so I do a new show every Friday but I mean you can just rack up any show you want so there's there's a whole bunch of amazing people um on there there's rowena from the subways um she's got a show on there uh, uh paul gallagher liam and noel's brother he's of got of course a show. <laughs> brilliant he's got a show in there um, well, all, all the likely lads are on there rich and Stuart are on there as well aren't they you're on there say if um, from uh the gorillas he's on there the bass player he's got a show on there i mean they've just there's so many people in there really but we never get to meet each other because obviously pandemic, we're all going at different times. Some people do it from their, well, most people do it from the houses. I'm the only sad one that actually goes to his Well, it's because, part of the experience and that you want to be in the studio doing it for real. And I just miss people and I want to yeah. see people, even if it's on the bus. Like that. Oh, <laughs> I'm yeah. out. I always think like with, with podcasts and, and internet and community radio stations now, I just don't know why anybody would ever listen to commercial radio. And, you know, I've worked in commercial radio and I worked for Kerrang, which is the only good commercial station, I think. But, you know, I, I had the great joy there of selecting all the music myself and I had 100% control over the playlist, could play what I want. Every other commercial radio station that you listen to, it's like the same 100 songs in loop. Uh, and I, no disrespect, but like a station like XFM, I'll see, oh my God, they're playing the Kaiser Chiefs, Foo Fighters. They're playing like the same... 25 songs for what seems like two decades now um you know with so many amazing stations out there why anybody would just tune into like you know heart or capital or any of those stations blows my mind um a few months back and it like you say i was just like i could i could actually go and have a shower and come back down and probably sing the same songs that i heard an hour ago yeah just like, why is that even a thing i don't really get it um and do you know what my lovely tax i got a taxi the other day and he had heart on <laughs> And I was like, oh, this is kind of tragic. It's got, yeah, I mean, it's lovely. Don't get me wrong. It's it's, it's very sweet music and everything. But I think... Yeah, it's Roman... inoffensive, isn't it? But it's just, oh, here we go again. You can almost predict the next song, can't you, every time? What what kind of stuff do you play? Uh, what, in my house? And on your radio show. I mean, I'm intrigued to know what gets on at home. But when um, you're playing your show, what go, what kind of goes into a Gail Porter playlist? Do you know what? I get lots of, like, new bands send me... Like demos and stuff so I'll, I'll play new bands so I've actually played I played um the Clockworks the other day which is Alan McGee's he's um new band I think they're from Ireland yeah so I played with them um Subways I played the other day there um anything really just whatever we fancy so Tom will come up with some ideas I'll come up with some but then also I'll go back to Adam Adam and the Ants or Blondie or you know just stuff that makes me happy well that's what music should do right yeah, I do anything eclectic. I don't want I don't want to be told what to do, which is the nice thing about being on Islington Radio is yeah. they just go do what you want, whatever you want. So I can play, you know, anything, absolutely anything I fancy. All these stations out there, if they paid you, would be the dream gig, wouldn't they? That's the problem with today's world. They're you know, like, hey. Do you want to do a thing there's no budget you're like of course there isn't no, <laughs> all the budgets when did they all go where did they go <laughs> i know i don't get paid for instance in radio but you know what? i don't care because yeah. i actually genuinely love it it costs me more money to get in there <laughs> yeah 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 i i'm paying to do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i really really enjoy myself and you know it makes me smile and i get to play music and you know and you know we dance in the studio sometimes well i dance tom just looks at me but um yeah i enjoy myself that's the main thing yeah and if i mean i'm four years into this show and i still don't make any money from it but i'm in it for the love <laughs> yeah still don't it's unbelievable i mean it, it's leading on to plenty of other opportunities which do allow me to to make some money like the book and various tours that i've done and this new podcast will hopefully get there but yeah i see this there, there was a period at the end of last year where i nearly stopped doing it because i got so frustrated with you know putting out great conversations with interesting people consistently you know putting out what i think to be one of the best interview podcasts out there if i can say so without sounding arrogant <laughs> and um yeah i'm just like after four years what's the point if i'm not making any money still it's driving me mad and then i thought you know what fuck it i was like this isn't the thing in my life that's gonna make me money there'll be other things that come from this that do this is just the thing that facilitates all the other things and that really enriches me and keeps me 
satisfied, content, and you know, like alive. I've got to pay the rent. I need to pay the rent. Yeah. Well, I'm 35, <laughs> single, and living with my parents. So, I mean, we'll see how long I can do that for. But, but for now, it's it's been nice reconnecting with them. And uh, I'm yeah. With a cat. So, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but at least you're paying your own rent gail at least you're yeah, paying your I own rent pay you've killed rent. it you've smashed it at life <laughs> no one's paying anything but yeah it's fine you know i'm, I'm not i'm not um do you know what i've been homeless before and i'm not that i'm going to be homeless again but you know i think once you've you've dealt with that you think you know what life is all right as long as i've got the basics to go on with i've got my friends i've got my daughter I've got some food in the cupboards, you know. I didn't have that a few years back. <laughs> That's nothing. So, um, yeah, I'm a very fortunate human being. That's it, isn't it? Food in your belly, roof over your head, good people in your life. And then so as you... long as you can just have a good, like, mindset and outlook on the world and, and remind yourself when you're feeling low that life is good, then exactly. you can get through it. Exactly. I live in the same street as a serial killer. Well, he's not with us anymore. He's dead now, but... Uh, I live in Dennis Nielsen Street. Really? Yeah, it's a real thing. I go Blow, jogging blowing past... up your spot, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I go jogging. I go jogging past his house every day, and I'm like, wow, yeah, wow. Well, that's the other thing, isn't there? Is there's as recent events have, have proven. There's there's a lot of darkness in this world. There's enough darkness in this too world. Much. There's Way there's enough much. sadness, and it's it's important, and I think good to try and contribute something that's happy and light and Exactly. Full of love and not hate. Yeah, let's just do that. Should we just like run for prime minister? God. Well, that's what corrupts even the purest of souls, politics. Yeah. That's what I'm always saying to everybody. I don't want to even go there. It just makes me sad now. I'm just like, my daughter was saying, who, who are you going to vote for? I was like, I genuinely don't know. I don't know. I just want to go home to Scotland for a wee while. That's it, really. Are you going to do that? Um, I don't know, to be honest. Um, well, once Honey goes to university, I'm kind of thinking I'm going to be lost. So um, I might go home for a wee while, but, you know, I don't, Scotland's quite small, but Edinburgh, yeah. when you just know people from your town, um, and I love it more than anything, but I kind of like getting lost in London sometimes. So, you know, that not every single person you know or went to school with, or I kind of like that, yeah, sometimes in London. I love Scotland more than anything in the whole world, but I don't know if I could live there again. Yeah, there's something about roots, isn't there, and history that yeah. no matter what you've been through or where you're at just reminds you of who you are and, yeah. and, and you know, why you're here. And But as you say, sometimes it's nice to just have that anonymity and get lost yeah. in the crowd as well. It's almost like you want to do a little bit of both, half, half a year in London, half in Scotland, 50-50, best of both worlds. Yeah. I might do that. My the occasional like, weekend trip to Manchester. <laughs> <laughs> I just turn up at my daughter's doorstep going, hello. She's like, go away. <laughs> well, we don't have the Hacienda there anymore. So, my God. It's flats we? now, isn't it? Is it? Oh. Yeah. As, as all the great venues are, it seems now, London is just becoming that. They're all getting torn yeah. down and flats are the new thing. Everything's, you know, culture's just getting whitewashed. The future's bleak for the youth, so it's up to people like Honey to to inject culture back into our society. Exactly. I love the fact <laughs> no that pressure. We've, we've done this on my birthday, and then you just go and life is shit, and then uh, they're just building flats. And anyway, have a great birthday, Gail. Bye. <laughs> well, do you know what though? We we got the tail end of the party, so and I always say that I I'm not bummed out about the future because I know that I had a good time whilst the going was good. good. Best I have had the best time. I've had really shitty times, yeah. but you know, I've always like landed on my feet eventually. So, and I've met the most amazing people on the journey that I've been on, and I'm very grateful for that. Amen. Happy birthday to you, Gail Porter. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's so nice to see you. Can't wait. We'll go and have, yeah, go to Hush in Mayfair. It's really nice. I'm up for it. Yeah, sounds good. I'll wear my best attire so I yeah. won't, I won't well, show you we'll up and embarrass you. <laughs> I just wear trainers and jeans now. That's it. Well, actually, when I'm, jeans are when I'm getting dressed up. Usually, I'm just in my tracksuit. Well, we'll we'll jean it up, and um, yeah, that'll be really nice. I'll keep you posted, but I'll definitely be in London in a few weeks. So, we'll perfect. Do it. You know, and I will see you when you arrive in London town. Thank have you. The, so have the most wonderful birthday. You had um, to for me, and if I you want to, get all up for it. 
and uh, get this book out. Yes. I'll send you some of it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's done. It's just, um, yeah, publishers, I don't know. Nobody. Yeah. Some people think it's all right. Some people don't want it. I don't know. Well, I've done it anyway. See what happens. It will come. The, the right yeah. publisher will present themselves. And uh, yeah, I, I can't wait for, after the documentary, I mean, that's like the, the icing on what's the phrase the the tip of the iceberg is what the documentary is and then the book will be the I can't, I can't believe the big kahuna got nominated for a bafta the one year where we can't actually go to a bafta celebrate i know Collins <laughs> with my mate going did i just win a bafta she's like yeah and i was like all right uh cool okay <laughs> it was like the big no <laughs> <laughs> Hey everyone! <laughs> I actually made friends with people sitting at the next table to me. I was like, "Hey, excuse me, do you want a glass of champagne?" They were like, "We don't know who you are," and I was like, "It doesn't matter. I just want a bafta." <laughs> they were like, and my friend Emma was like, "Oh God, girls, stop talking! Just stop talking!" I was like, "We could just make friends." She went, "You can't. It's a pandemic." I was like, "Oh no, it's okay." <laughs> it's an amazing achievement, though. An amazing achievement. Very well deserved. We never thought it would happen, but you know, it, it's everyone that made it i mean they put up with me for six months seven months i couldn't put up with me for six i put up with me because i live with me because so, <laughs> i am me because i am me <laughs> but i could not imagine uh, those poor people having to listen to me waffle on and cry and laugh and then cry again bless them well it just goes to show you doesn't it at 49 which you were then life can still throw you some surprises so here's exactly. to here's to the future and, and whatever's next Perfect. Well, thank you so much. It's so lovely to see your wee face, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. You too, gal. Mwah. Much love. Lots Happy of love. Happy birthday to you. Oh, Take care. Much. Bye bye. Bye bye.